Hello, and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. My name is Joe Carr. This is the one you've been waiting for. Our guest today is John O'Hurley, star of stage and screen, author, entrepreneur, and member of the class of 1976. A prolific performer across movies, television, and theater, John is as versatile as he is accomplished. Who among us doesn't brim with pride just a little bit when we catch a Seinfeld rerun that features Jay Peterman, or we tune into the National Dog Show on Thanksgiving, knowing that we share Providence College DNA with John O'Hurley. In this interview, we talked about his student days and the PC people who influenced his career. We talked about dogs, and he went into the Peterman persona for just a minute. John, greetings from Friartown. Thank you for joining us today. Well, nice to be here. I can't think of a better place to spend some time. <laughs> One thing people may not know about you is that your Providence College roots run deep. Your dad, a retired physician also named John, was a member of the class of 1948. Your brother, Neil, followed you here to PC. Let's start by talking about your dad. How's Dr. O'Hurley doing? He's wonderful. He's a 92-year-old grandpa and uh, sharp as a tack. He still swims every day and has his uh, political discussions in the pool with his boys, <laughs> B-O-I-C, and, uh, and uh, plays golf. So he's still active and keen, and he's actually... Uh, you know, very accomplished uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor. And uh, to uh, to his credit, he is now still studying neurology and um, is also uh, learning French. So as T.S. Eliot said, old men must be explorers, and he's a great <laughs> example of that. So you were born just over in the New Hampshire border in Kittery, Maine. Was it always a given that you would come to PC? Well, it was always a possibility, uh, you know, because, of course, I grew up a big fan of uh, PC basketball, and even in those... Even in the 60s, I would uh, listen to the games on the radio at night, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the weak AM radio signal uh, still uh, it was uh, still enough to, to, uh, to permeate into Hartford, Connecticut, or West Hartford, where I grew up most of my life. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I was always very, you know, PC was always a very strong entity, and uh, it was one of several choices that I was uh, looking at when it was time for me to come to college. Um, at the time, we were living uh, in Fort Lauderdale, so coming north to me was, uh, you know, kind of a change of scenery again. What was the theater program like when you were a PC student? <laughs> Listen to my laugh. <laughs> <laughs> It was uh, uh, it was almost non-existent. Uh, you know, it was kind of a concentration uh, in uh, the humanities program. Um, it wasn't an actual degree um, uh, that uh, changed as I um, uh, stayed there, Providence. Um, and I think, if I remember correctly, I was the only theater graduate my senior year. So, consequently, I won the theater award. Congratulations on that. That's good, good Thank news. You. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's called thinning the herd. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> what were some of the influences on you when it comes to learning to perform? You had some opportunities, uh, obviously within a small group, but were there people here who kind of took you under their wing and, and really had some capacity for helping to point you in the right direction? Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I knew from the age of three when people would say, what do you want to be with when you grow up? And with the sense of disgust that only a three-year-old can muster, I would point to the black and white television in the corner of the living room, and I would say, well, I am an actor, so that's what I'm going to be. And it wasn't that I wanted to be an actor. It was that I knew I was an actor. So for my entire life, always watching television and, uh, and going to the movies, I always knew that I was supposed to be there. And I can't tell you why, I just knew. So for, for me, growing up was really about kind of connecting those dots together. Um, so when I came to Providence, uh, you know, it, it, in, you know, oddly enough, not a theater school, I probably, uh, could have, uh, made other choices, um, for, uh, for my college degree. Uh, that, but I, there was something about Providence that I, re I was really, really attracted to. Um, and, you know, even at the level that they were at, you know, they were doing plays, they did, uh, Oh, three, four productions a year um, in the group that was there. Uh, and they were very nice productions, very quality and a very talented group of people. There just wasn't really a theater degree, per se. So it was, it was kind of a uh, kind of a, a, a side interest for, for many people, but that didn't deny their talent. Um, and so for me, it was it was a wonderful experience to be 
totally immersed, and I say totally immersed because not only was I auditioning for the shows, uh, I was building the sets, uh, we were helping with the publicity, we were printing the programs. It was a total immersion in all forms of theater, and that was kind of the, the thing that I loved about it. It became kind of my, my, um, it became my pastime, my avocation, my vocation, and then also my sense of socialization as well, too. Having served for many years as a trustee and a, a, an avid supporter of the arts here at PC, you've seen the sort of evolution and growth of the programs here. What sort of a, a sense of pride do you take in what the, the theater program specifically has become? Well, I, it, it's wonderful. And, and I, I can point in one direction to a guy named John Garrity, who uh, came back to the college uh, there uh, my senior year. He had been a senior when I was a freshman, but he came back and uh, took over the program and I think really led it through its, um, uh, you know, its early evolution into uh, a recognized degree program. Um, and then through all of the battles of trying to, uh, to actually build a facility. And uh, at, uh, at one point they have the wonderful uh, center there, the Smith Center, uh, which I would arguably say is one of the better theaters uh, that I've seen anywhere in the country. You'll be glad to know the students are getting rave reviews uh, with regard to Something Rotten, which debuted the other day at the theater, and uh, that's what they're they're bringing to us this semester, and so far, people really like what they see. Well, I, the, the, what a great choice of a show. I think it's one of the funniest things, and, and certainly tests the mettle of, uh, of uh, actors anywhere. It's just a, it's a, it's a wonderful, extemporaneous, improvisational style of theater, and uh, uh, I, I enjoyed it immensely on Broadway. Can we go back for a moment to those early days when you were looking at that black and white television and, and going to the movies from time to time? Could you be a little more specific about some of the the actors and, and some of the programs and films that really inspired you at a young age? Well, I, I you know, I, I'd, I'd like to tell you there were things like Citizen Kane and things, <laughs> things like that, things with those academic right. weight to them, scholarly things. But no, it was romper room. It was, it was uh, uh, the things that I was watching, the monsters. I, you know, kind of uh, at the time when I was a young kid, I looked just like Eddie Munster. We had the same, we had that same dark widow's peak. Uh, and coincidentally, Eddie, uh, uh, he uh, is, is now a dear friend of mine. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of funny to have that big circle of you know to the kids that you you'd have watched on television. I was a I was a friend, but um, but those I mean it was just, I was just watching common television at the time. Uh, but I was always supposed to be there. In fact, I'll tell you a story very quickly of uh, when I was ten years old. Um, I uh, I remember you know my connection with acting was was watching the Tonight Show, and I would. I would um, I would steal the uh, black and white portable television, uh, portable because it weighed 40 pounds, <laughs> and um, stick it under my covers, and I would watch the Johnny Carson show every night, which is now now what people know as the Tonight Show. But I would watch it because that's where actors went, and actors always had stories when they were on the Johnny Carson show. And true story, I actually I remember during a commercial break getting up out of bed, walking around the room with, again with my hands on my hips and frustrated to no end because I didn't have any stories and I didn't know what I was going to tell him when I went on the Johnny Carson show. Again, I knew I was supposed to be there. So you cut to many years later and the first time that I was on The Tonight Show and uh, it was with Jay Leno who had uh, taken over for Johnny Carson. And I remember sitting in the chair next to him and he asked me to stay through the break. Uh, this was uh, during the Seinfeld days. And um, so I did, and uh, while he was going through his notes and his producer was queuing him up for the next uh, segment, um, I was just sitting there with my hands on either arm of the chair, and I was looking out at the audience there. And I had a, apparently an expression that was uh, kind of perplexing, because he looked over at me and he says, John, you okay? You know, and that voice of his, that was kind of like this. Um, and I said, no, I said, I'm fine. I said, I was just looking out there and saying hi to a 10-year-old kid. Oh, that's nice. True that's story. nice, right. And when you get sure. asked, get invited to stay through the break, that's a great sign on, the, on a show like it's that, right? Sign. So that's yes. a <laughs> wonderful story. It's such a long road for somebody like you because so much difficulty you have to endure, the heartbreak and the, the hard times, but to finally succeed is really an incredible achievement. Do you remember a point in time where you said to yourself, I've made it. I'm going to be able to, to make this my, my life's work being a performer? 
Well, you know, you never know. It's it's because uh, you know, it's like if if I was playing basketball in the NBA, I would know my career was ending when my knees went out, um, and uh, you know, I was losing my speed. You know, there's a definite. There are definitive uh, means of of um, of the longevity and the style of your career, but not so with acting. Uh, you know, you just never know. You know, I'm hired to be fired, and every job I ever have will eventually end, and I have to know that going into it. And there's always the constant need to stay relevant to this business. Um, the business is very unkind. It's very subjective. There's The deck is always stacked against you. There's always more people that want uh, an opportunity than, um, than, than opportunities are available. So you have to know that going in, and so you have to develop a pretty thick skin and that rejection is just somebody else's opportunity. And, uh, and I've been rejected many, many times. I don't take it. I try not to take it personally. Uh, or if I do, I allow myself to mourn for 24 hours and that's it. Uh, and I move on and I just decide that it's some, it was somebody else's opportunity and good luck to them. Um, so you have to have a healthy perspective on the thing, uh, on, uh, on entertainment because it's, uh, it's a very, it's a very cool, uh, it's a very cool mistress. So many of the things you've done, you have done, in fact, all of them, as far as I know, require certain measures of confidence, determination, and ability to bring that perspective that you just mentioned into into what you're thinking about in, in the right measures. I'm thinking of, of course, acting, also writing books, operating a business, the J. Peterman Company. Can you draw any of those attributes back to your PC experiences or even your PC heritage? Well, absolutely. Uh, I, I think um, probably the most profound influence on me um, was my senior year, the head of the Arts Honors Program, Father Thomas Coskren, who has since passed away. Um, he, uh, he took a, a kind of a, a shine to me, a liking to me, and, and wanted to help mentor me a bit. And um, not only in the theater, but also... Um, everything that supported the arts. Um, and uh, he took me into the arts arms program, which I truly didn't belong in. But um, And he put me in a course that was called the Modalities of Religious Consciousness in the 20th Century, which is kind of a long way of saying, here's a few, we're going to, disc we're going to uh, look at the concept of morality, arts, and, um, and philosophy through the eyes of contemporary literature in the, uh, in the, um, Arts Honors Program there. So he took me through T.S. Eliot. He took me through G.K. Chesterton. He took me through Peter Schaffer, who wrote the wonderful play Equus. And these almost became like mini Bibles to me. Um, and, and I look back on my life right now, and it's I see the entire world um, through those perspectives. So it was probably the most meaningful experience I had um, at the time when I needed it the most. And I would say that uh, that uh, his class and his um, his passion to help me um, become a deeper a deeper and uh, more well rounded uh, artist um, was absolutely uh, was unshakable, and I'm eternally grateful for the experience. It's interesting, but perhaps not coincidental that Father Shanley also lists Father Coskren as one of his primary influences. You and Father Shanley were here at approximately the same time. Father Shanley deserved to be in the Arts Owners Program, and I did not, so there was an art difference. Uh, <laughs> he was able to glean much more out of it than I was. <laughs> but, uh, but as I say, it, uh, it, it, the, the testament of time, it, it just, uh, the things that I learned through this class, that, uh, and also just being around him, uh, because that's one of the things I loved about Providence is that you could be so close to the um, the Dominican priests and and you know the 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 lectures you know were in the classroom but were also over a glass of wine uh, you know in a in a in a collaboration of students that they would all get together and entertain and and uh, it you know it never stopped it was twenty four seven. So let's talk a little bit about your career shortly after PC, and I'd like to talk a bit about daytime dramas, uh, soap operas. I was recently listening to Alec Baldwin's podcast, and he interviewed Peter Bergman, whom he called the king of the soaps. Fascinating discussion about this kind of work and how intense it is, a new script day after day. And you did a fair bit of this early in your career. What was that experience like, and how did it prepare you for some of the things you would do later? Well, it, it was, uh, daytime television was, uh, it, it seemed kind of a natural fit for me. 
uh, as much as I um, liked being a Broadway actor when I first went to New York, and that's really kind of all I ever thought of myself as. But the, the, the notion that you could be on television as well was always something that um, was kind of otherworldly to me because it's a different style of acting. When I'm on stage, I have, you know, I have this entire vacuum out there. I have this entire arena out there in front of me. I can see and I can hear and my voice reverberates off the back wall. And it, it's almost an organic experience. I need the audience as much as they need me. Television is a different medium. Because every, the only thing that matters is that little black hole called the television camera. And everything else is irrelevant. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So you find this incredible amount of energy that is being demanded by that little, that little, <laughs> little black hole. And um, it's, it's very awkward for an actor to learn how to all of a sudden uh, act on television, that less is more. That you do less with your, you don't have to get, you don't have to hit the back wall with your voice because they have microphones. Um, you don't have to move your your face too much because um, uh, the television camera <laughs> will, does all the work for you. So it's just it's a different style of acting, and uh, it certainly took me a while. Uh, I started on the edge of night in '83, um, and then my experience went all the way in through the early '90s on uh, daytime. I did some of the um, kind of uh, uh, I was uh, kind of pioneering uh, some of the things. Uh, I was the first uh, twin brothers on daytime television back when I was on Loving on uh, ABC. One of them had come back from the dead, <laughs> and uh, the other one was just an awfully good guy. And uh, so, uh, um, obviously, the, the the evil one had come to town to impersonate the other one and uh, locked me away in a prison with a, guarded by a do Doberman. And uh, as, as strange as that all seems, it seems to work on daytime without much, much logic. Well, I'm sure you, um, you made it work, uh, right? So. Well, I, you know, it was very fun. I, I had a great, great deal of fun. But I, I, the PS to that was uh, they had to find a body double for me to be able to, um, to do both characters so that they could shoot over the shoulder of the body double to my face and then reverse it the other way around when they needed to do the other character. So they had to find a body double that looked as much as they could like me, and they found this guy who was the a bouncer down at a nightclub called the uh, the Limelight, an old church down in Lower Manhattan, and it was uh, a, a, a well recognized uh, a disco after hours. So anyway, they pulled him and they used him as my body double for nine months. And he was always talking about the play that he was writing. And he, at the time, I always felt he was a terrible actor. And I just said, just tell him not to talk. He's kind of these dems and does. And, and I said, I, it's just throwing me off. Um, and the play that he was writing was the play of his life and growing up. And I would comment to him, well, I would say, well, good for you. <laughs> and uh, it turns out it was Chaz Palminteri and what he was writing was Bronx Tale. Wow. Yeah, that was my <laughs> body double. And Chaz and I are still good friends. Chaz and I will always be good friends, and we can't see each other without uh, both both of us pinching ourselves to say that uh, we had a we we had a, a time in life together. That's I would have sworn that you're a lot taller than he is. No, uh, no, actually, okay. no. Chaz is actually quite tall. Oh, about that, about well, that. Right now. Yeah. It's a great story. So um, the National Dog Show, John, is coming up later this month, the 18th year for that Thanksgiving Day on NBC. It's really a phenomenon. Great uh, entertainment for families and, and people who love dogs on a holiday. You must take great pride in what that has become. Well, I, you know, I take, I take great pride in the fact that, uh, you know, we allow the dogs to become the stars. It's very little that David and I, my co-host David Fry and I do. We just let the dogs be and I think that's probably our best posturing is to make sure that the dogs become the stars, that it really is all about them. So we do very little in terms of on camera stuff there. And it's mostly just talking about the dogs and the celebration of uh, the history of breeding in the country. But it's a it's a great piece of programming where you have um, 30 million plus people watching uh, two hours of television right after the Macy's parade and right before uh, football begins. So it's a great family event. And it's something that everybody, whether you're four or you're 94, uh, there's something in it for you. And it celebrates the thing that, you know, mo most of America has and most of, of America loves our dogs. Between that show, the Easter weekend dog show on NBC and your books, canines are obviously a, a big part of your career so what is it about dogs that, that appeals to you so much 
Well, I've, um, as I wrote in one of my uh, first first book, uh, I think uh, I wrote this. Uh, I said, "I'm a better person with a dog in my lap," and, and uh, I think it underscores what dogs do for us. They round off the edges in our lives, and I can't really remember a time in our lives when we didn't have a dog. You know, there was always a a, a, a breed in our house, and uh, we always had um, wonderful, wonderful dogs. Uh, and uh, you know, they they were kind of the measure of my life. I was wondering about your first dog. What do you remember about about your first dog? Well, I remember quite um, quite well. In fact, I do talk about that first dog in my one man show that I tour around the country now. Um, it was uh, it was a little uh, it was a little dachshund named Taffy, and Taffy was a little chocolate uh, colored uh, dachshund and would wait for me to come home from first grade because at that time in my life I had discovered my secret hiding place. Uh, we were living in just outside of Boston, Natick, Massachusetts, and uh, at the end of the cul-de-sac uh, there was a there was a pond, which is actually more like a swamp, uh, but that was my that was my kingdom at the end of the day. And for a little boy, that's probably the most interesting place they can spend their hours. And uh, I would circumnavigate the, uh, the the swamp every day with Taffy following behind me. And uh, that was back when you were allowed to do those things, and you had to be home by uh, by dinner time. Um, but we would walk around and turn over rocks and stones. I had my net there, and we would catch uh, frogs and turtles and anything that was uh, moving and kind of play around with them. And then, uh, and then if I was lucky enough, I would get to the rock outcropping that hung over the pond, and and I would um, watch the uh, the train go by at 4:30 in the afternoon up the eastern seaboard from uh, coming up from who knows where and heading who knows where. But it was uh, the train heading to Boston. And I remember sitting there on that rock and um, with Taffy and uh, and listening for the for the sound that the sound of silence that the train left as it would uh, rattle on down the tracks, and I was always very just very overwhelmed by the stillness that would be left there, and I think that's where I became kind of I think I started to develop the more poetic side of myself there, and Taffy was always my companion, and the great thing about dogs is that they know not to say anything they just to listen i've always thought about the dogs in my life that they wake up and think what can i do to make these people around me happy <laughs> it's such a nice thing exactly. isn't it yeah. it, it really is I, I think it's uh it is kind of the um the, the reminder that uh, there are guarding angels i'd like to talk a little about seinfeld so in what mm-hmm. ways did seinfeld change your life well, from the sheer visibility of being on the number one show in the history of television, that certainly, you can't, you can't beat that, I'll tell you. Uh, and it was fun to play a character that they was just kind of be otherworldly in terms of uh, the, the arc of the character from what it started and to where it ended. I mean, he became a, a kind of a, a raving corporate lunatic uh, at one point, and, uh, and it was just a lot of fun to play and just watch the writers get, have so much fun writing um, you know, the monologue, the Jay Peterman monologues, uh, because he was just, you know, he was this kind of mad Irish poet on a cliff. And, uh, you know, that, it was just just an awful lot of fun to play. And it, it and surprised you every week they came up with a with a great and, and more absurd scenario that he was uh, he was going to drive or lead you through. Is it an exaggeration to say that that dialogue is drawn from the Peterman catalogs? Is that really how that well, all came I, about in the first place? It sure is. Yeah, it was always uh, the the character and the uh, and the storylines were always a parody of the way the J. Peterman catalog was written, which are these you know it's this one of a kind um, clothing and uh, and in furniture and uh, and it's just interesting accessories and antiques and um, but it was always written kind of like a uh, a kind of a Hemingway novel as though you had uh, kind of picked it up mid-conversation. And uh, there were these long adventure stories about an Oxford button-down or a, a, an elusive swatch of corduroy or something. But there was always this, and, and there was world travels and everything. So it's it, very eccentric. Um, it, and, and there's really nothing like the J. Peterman catalog. As Tom Hanks once said to me, he said, it's the only catalog I read to my wife. And he says, I'll read it cover to cover in bed to her. And he says, I use your voice. What a great compliment. I was looking at <laughs> looking at jpeterman.com today to get a sense of some of those uh, captions and descriptions, and it's a great website. Of course, your company now, and I uh, would encourage any fans of that character or people interested in, 
in that company to, to take a look and familiarize themselves with the, the great use of words to describe these items. It's really a lot of fun. It really is. It's a it's a celebration of language and, and business, and uh, uh, at the same time, it really is a wonderful, wonderful a piece of authenticity. I recently recently listened to an interview you did with my old friend Rich Kimball in Bangor, Maine, on Downtown with Rich Kimball. You're a regular guest there, and Rich is a, a great interviewer. And in that, uh, you shared a lost monologue from Seinfeld. Could we impose on you to take us into the J. Peterman character a little bit somewhere <laughs> oh, for, think, for a moment? I think I, I, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. It was in the uh, in the Friars Club episode That's the when one. Uh, mm-hmm. when um, Rob Schneider was playing my hard of hearing assistant, and uh, he was uh, anytime I would sign a work uh, a workload, he would go home. Huh? And, uh, and I would say, well, never mind, Elaine, you do it. So she was all of a sudden ac- accumulating all of his workload and was a little upset about it. Well, I, I totally had mistaken that I thought she was trying to have a little tete-a-tete on uh, office time with him. And uh, so I decided I was going to play Cupid and encourage the relationship. And so I walk into her office one afternoon, and I slap down two tickets to the Karamazov Brothers Circus, and I tell her that she and Bob can knock off a little early to get ready. And she looks at me as though I'd grown a second head, and she said, Bob. And this was the, this was the monologue that they had to cut from the show because the show was too long. I said, Elaine, don't worry. I, too, am no stranger to love on the clock. As a young lad, my father apprenticed me to a honey factory in Belize. The cheap beekeeper was this horrible hag of a woman with gnarled teeth and a giant wart that she called a nose. Woo-hoo. She was not attractive, even by backward standards. But love is truly blind, Elaine. And as the days went on, working closer and closer together, that sweet smell of honey in the air, I knew I had to have that horrible creature. And I did. So you and Bob have a good time tonight. <laughs> it must be fun, to, great? Must be oh, fun to visit the Peterman character once in a while. Oh, it is. It is. It is. But what great writing. You know, oh, it's yes. like I, I celebrate that. I celebrate the writers and the and, where they have gone in their careers, uh, you know, it's just wonderful to just see, uh, you know, to see the fact that so many great shows that have followed off uh, the heels of Seinfeld um, have done so because the writers of, of the Seinfeld writers, you know, engineered them. And there is no doubt that they appreciate what your delivery of their lines did for their careers, too. So I think that, that's a two way street. <laughs> So, well, as Shakespeare once said, the play is the thing. He never said the actor was the thing. <laughs> With Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, now Apple creating content, and that's just a name of, of very few, it seems it's obvious there's more than ever. I'm wondering how that changes things for performers. Certainly, there, I would guess there are more opportunities, but you must have to weigh quality versus quantity very differently. What's, what's that like from your perspective in 2019? Well, I think the writer is better. The, the, the writing is better now, um, and there's more of it. Uh, the economics are a little bit different now. Uh, you know, they still have to put this content out. They've got to spend, you know, spend full price for it. So uh, a lot of people, you know, and a lot of companies are going into, you know, the speculative markets, and uh, you know, they've got to go into hawk immediately, uh, hoping that these series have a, you know, a lifetime after them um, for those who are binge watchers on either Netflix or Hulu or any of these other uh, entertainment platforms. But it, uh, it does, it changes the dynamics and the economics of entertainment greatly. It's uh, we no longer have those three networks that we used to have. And we no longer have sitcoms that are, you know, 21 minutes long and you can shove in 30 second commercials. That whole business, that whole model has changed. <laughs> They're doing five minute interstitials right now. Um, they're doing, you know, they're doing programming that is as long as it needs to be. Uh, so time is of a different essence. We don't do commercials in, in anymore. We have things that are sponsored. So the the um, content and the economics of, of the whole model of entertainment has changed. Um, and, and the lines between um, commercialization and content are almost indistinguishable right now, as is the world of music and entertainment. Uh, the, you know, you're finding that People that were normally singers are now singers and actors. Um, you know the pop cult. You know the pop musical culture is now moving seamlessly into um, into our um, visual lives as well. So the National Dog Show is coming up on Thanksgiving Day on NBC. We'll be tuned in 
for sure. What else should we be looking for and listening for when it comes to John O'Hurley performances? Well, I still have my show on Broadway, Chicago the Musical, which I try to visit uh, for a couple of months every year, six to eight weeks. Uh, I've had that on tour for a long time. I just finished my 2000th performance as Billy Flynn, the, uh, the silver-haired lawyer. And uh, I have a one-man show called A Man with Standards. I tour around the country, and it's um, and I've actually done a Providence College for one of the reunion weekends a couple of years back. But I, uh, it's a show, uh, it's kind of a musical memoir. Uh, that I've written about the stories of my life and also the good fortune I had to grow up in the 50s and the 60s around the music of the the standards, the great American songbook, and and at the same time, lucky enough to grow up in the shadow of men who had standards. My my father and uh, and and his ilk, the uh, the gentlemen of that that period of time, and I and I talk a lot about it, and I talk about how lucky I was about. You know, growing up at a time when the music and the manners were indistinguishable, it was the way we related to each other and the, um, and the way we communicate with, with each other. You've been very generous with your time, John. We really appreciate it. And there's one more thing I'd like to uh, hear you talk about just a little bit, and that is that you are really dedicated to an important cause and trying to help other people. And this relates to epilepsy and uh, sudden unexpected death syndrome and you're really involved in some serious research there on this this important and and really kind it of is, frightening yeah. matter. It has a it has, yeah, it has a very personal uh, attachment to it because I lost my sister back in 1970 uh, to sudden death and epilepsy, uh, and we didn't know anything about it back then. Uh, but there is a syndrome within the epilepsy, and epilepsy affects um, mil- millions and millions of people. So over three million people in the U.S. Uh, have uh, epilepsy. And uh, and about uh, several thousand of them die every year for no reason, and no one can explain why. And most of them are children, and it's uh, it's heartbreaking. Uh, the stories I, I read from people that have communicated with me over the internet on the, the stories of, of of having lost a brother, a sister, a, a son, or a daughter, and uh, it's just heart heart uh, rending. But um, there hasn't been any research done over this this thief in the night, as I call it. Uh, and so I'm trying, I'm taking this next two years and raising the money that's necessary for what we're calling the biomarker challenge in SUDEP. And that is the idea of uh, trying to find a biomarker, which would give the database that will be necessary to find a cure for this. Uh, that's as, as we all saw a sudden infant death syndrome, maybe a couple generations back. Um, that was just basically disappeared because they had found the bio. They found the biomarker challenge for or biomarker for it, and uh, and could attack it from that way. Um, I'm hoping for the same results uh, in epilepsy, uh, and if so, it'll be the biggest leap that they've made in epilepsy in over 100 years. So it should be. Uh, it's a very. Uh, it's a spirited and deeply personal cause. If people would like to learn more about it or perhaps get involved in some way, is there a place that, that we can, can look to find out more? Yes, you can go to the website for the um, Epilepsy Foundation of America. You can uh, uh, check in on their page there, the SUDEP, S-U-D-E-P, SUDEP, Sudden Unexplained Death in Epilepsy. We will definitely put that in the show notes and encourage our listeners to to check that out and, and learn more about uh, this important cause and important work you're doing. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you again for joining us today, John. This has been fun. Would it be okay if we come back to you some other time maybe and, and uh, pick up on some more uh, of uh, discussion about your career and some of the things that uh, you have done? I'll try to establish another lifetime of events. <laughs> Thanks again and take care. Great to talk to you. That was the pride of Providence College, John O'Hurley. Thank you for joining us today. You can subscribe to the Providence College podcast at all the usual places, and they're available on the college's YouTube channel. Thanks to our producer, Chris Judge. I'm Joe Carr. Until next time.